All right, good morning, everybody. Um, as the first speaker showed us, uh, it's complex in Harris County, and I'll just leave it at that. Um, one thing to point out, there are two flood control reservoirs in Harris County. Hopefully everybody is aware of those after Hurricane Harvey. We have Attics and Barker. These are Army Corps of Engineers designed, maintained, and operated. The Harris County Flood Control District does not operate these reservoirs. They were built in the 1940s to protect this area that was developing. Uh, and it was really probably in, not understood at that point that development would spread this far to the west. They have floodgates here on Attics, here on Barker, and then there are two spillways on each at their ends, which is a little bit different than what you would see at most uh, reservoirs. So you have spillways here, 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 and here. And one of those spillways was engaged during Harvey. We'll talk about that in a second. So this is a track of Harvey coming up through the Caribbean, uh, falling apart through this region, and then going from a tropical depression to a Category 4 hurricane in 48 hours, making landfall down in Rockport and Port Aransas. Uh, not unusual to see rapid development in the Gulf of Mexico. That can happen. That's why you should have your plan in place on June the 1st, because things can happen. They can happen quickly in the Gulf. What is as unusual is to see the storm move inland like this, slow down and stall and then meander around the area uh, for the next three to four days. So this was the forecast on Saturday morning, August the 26th, and the forecasts for Harvey were really, really good. This was producing anywhere from three to three and a half feet of rain across the area. Um, I, I think the, the struggle with the forecast for Harvey was the comprehension of what this was going to do. And also what I've heard a lot of I knew it was going to rain 40 inches, but I thought it was going to rain 10 inches a day for four days. And anyone who's lived here any amount of time knows that that's not how our weather works. We tend to get big chunks of rain in a short period of time, and that is what we are susceptible to, and that's what can cause a lot of our flooding. Um, it's interesting to note that the largest rainfall forecast put out for this area prior to Harvey was actually back on the tax day storm on April 16, and that was about 12 inches. So this is running somewhere on the order of three times the forecast of the tax day storm going out publicly before it really started to rain. So that's a tremendous credit to the National Weather Service and their ability to their ability to forecast the storm. This is landfall on Friday evening. That's a Cat 4 tearing its way into the mid coast. Uh, 151 mile per hour wind gust at Rockport. Had we had not had the flooding up here in Houston, Galveston, the story would be down in Rockport and Puerto Rancos. And let's not forget that. Uh, this is the strongest hurricane to strike the Texas coast since Hurricane Carla in 1961. Carla made landfall right there at Fort O'Connor. And this is the deadliest hurricane to strike the state since 1919. 68 direct fatalities from Harvey. Almost all of them were freshwater flooding inland. In the Houston Galveston area, we were fine uh, Friday, Friday night, and all day Saturday. As a matter of fact, Saturday, keeping um, the messaging that this is not over, the storm has been downgraded from a hurricane to a tropical storm. That does not mean the threat is over. We were never facing a hurricane threat here on the Urban Texas coast in Houston Galveston. We were always facing a flood threat. And people get a little antsy, especially on the weekend, when you tell them to stay at home and the sun's outside shining, and so they're going to start doing their normal things. And that's what we were starting to see on Saturday and Saturday night. Uh, this is the center. This is still a 65 mile an hour tropical storm northwest of Victoria, about 140 miles or so from Houston, and things went very bad very quickly on Saturday evening, starting about mid evening, you know, with this single feeder band. Of rain. You see, this was not a very large feeder band with respect to how wide it is, very long in, in scope to the south and the north. Um, but this feeder band would move very slowly across Harris <coughs> County during the night and drop rainfall anywhere from four to seven inches per hour. And it was just devastating to our county. Uh, this is the next morning at 10 a.m. Initially, the very significant flooding was focused in this part of the county in the about 11 p.m. through about 3 or 4 a.m. time frame. And then by Sunday morning, uh, midday, pretty much all of Harris County was involved. And it wasn't just Harris County. It was all the surrounding counties. And at this point in time, 80% of the city of Dickinson and Galveston County was underwater. 
flooding in Fort Bend County, flooding in Montgomery County, flooding in Waller County. And I'll show you in a minute how widespread this was. So these are some of the rainfall totals, uh, almost seven inches in an hour. Most of our underground street drainage systems can handle about two inches an hour before they become full and overwhelmed. So we were greatly exceeding the capacity of our curb and gutter underground systems to carry the water. Uh, almost a foot of rain in two hours. It's tremendous rainfall rates that unleashed across Harris County. Uh, 12 hours of 21 inches, two feet in 24 hours. And the difference between Harvey and anything else we faced is that it kept going. It just would not stop. Now the rainfall rates after the first 24 hours or so began to slow down, but we kept piling on about a 10, anywhere from 10 to 12 inches additional rain each 24 hour period up to the four day total. Uh, maximum totals over here in the Beaumont Port Arthur area of 60 and a half inches of rain. There's some estimation that down in the marshlands of southern Jefferson County it might have been 65 inches. There's no gauge truth. Each one of these rainfall totals right here would exceed the previous highest tropical cyclone rainfall record in American history of 48 inches. So how does Harvey compare to some of the other floods? Obviously, Allison was our benchmark flood before Harvey. I don't think any of us could imagine a storm worse than Allison, and uh, then we had it. And what's interesting is Allison still holds higher rainfall here in the 6, 12, and 24 hour periods. Um, I put tax day up here because most of us know, remember tax day, there just really isn't any comparison at all to tax day. Um, what's interesting, if you notice here, most of the water in tax day fell in about a six hour period. If you look at Memorial Day 15, 11 inches of rain in three hours. And then it stopped raining. It didn't rain anymore. And that is showing two things. One, we get really intense rainfalls here. Lots of rain in a short period of time. So what are you going to do with all that water? And second, it shows how different Harvey was, is that it just kept going. And I put October 1994 up. Some of you might remember October 94. This is when the San Jacinto River, the pipelines ruptured on the river. The river caught on fire. Uh, this was a record flood for a lot of areas in northern eastern Harris County that Harvey exceeded. But I put it up here, the totals fall short, but the spatial coverage, how large the footprint of rainfall was in 1994, is actually pretty similar to Harvey. So here's that footprint. This is the 30 inch area. It went from roughly the Sabine down to the Colorado uh, River. From the coast inland to about Honro, that little white dot there is the 60, 62 inches of rain over Jefferson County. Uh, everything you see in yellow was between 15 and 20 inches of rain. So it wasn't just Harris County. If you look at Memorial Day 15 or Tax Day 16, that was a portion of Harris County, maybe a portion of Waller, maybe a portion of Fort Bend. This was the entire region. We had record flooding on not only a lot of the Harris County bayous and creeks, but the rivers, the Brazos, the San Bernard, the Colorado, the Trinity, all had very high water levels. So it wasn't just Harris County. We had about a trillion gallons of waterfall over four days. On average, about 34 inches of rain across the entire county, 68% of what we normally get in an entire year. That's 69% of our PMP. And PMP is the probable maximum precipitation. It's what meteorologists physically thought could fall out of the sky in a four-day period. For Harris County, it's about 48 inches of rain. The 47.4 maximum total on Clear Creek at I-45 was 95% of what we physically thought could fall out of the sky. And obviously, with some of those totals on the Gulf Freeway over 50 inches, that PMP is going to have to be looked at. We've heard a lot about return frequencies and how we've had 800 year storms in the last week. Um, that is not how return frequencies work. It is a chance or a statistic of getting that amount of rain or that high of a water level uh, on a creek or a bayou. And so this is the rainfall that fell out of the sky. This is the four day total. And the entire Harris County had anywhere between a 2,000 and a 5,000 year event or statistically between a 0.05% chance and a 0.02% chance of having that much rainfall in any given year. Up to about a 20,000 year event down here in the southeast part of the county, which was just a really, really, really tiny chance 
of having that amount of rain in any given year. Now granted, we're taking 150 years of record and extending this out to 20,000 years, so there's probably a little bit of error in there, but that's the best we got. And really the point of this is to show the historic nature of the rainfall and the um, low probability of having a storm like Harvey happen. That's the rain that's out of the sky. This is how high the water rose in the creeks and the bayous. So this is where your 100-year flood elevations, your 500-year flood elevations come into play. Uh, everything that you see in red, the water level uh, rose to or exceeded the 1% or 100-year flood elevation. So you see significant amounts of red, and everything you see in purple, the water level exceeded the 500-year water surface elevation. And in some cases, we're talking feet above the 500-year water surface elevation. Uh, notice the pattern here of the purple, or the higher elevations around the edge of the county. Uh, these are our more rural creeks, and so they drain much more like a river system. And an event like Harvey, where you continuously dump water over a period of time, allows those rural creeks to get higher and higher and higher and reach these really high levels. So you can kind of see that pattern showing up, where you have these 500 year levels which are greater, the highest water levels around the edges of the county. Now, that doesn't diminish the fact that we had horrible flooding on Grays and Buffalo, uh, but those bayous are more susceptible to the intense rainfall rates. So they were hit very hard on Sunday night, I'm sorry, Saturday night, Sunday morning. The bayou came up, they flooded, and then as the rainfall rates decreased, even though we kept piling water, the rainfall rates decreased, those bayous actually went back down because they're very effective at carrying the water and getting it <coughs> Uh, this is the records, so this exceeds everything that we previously have known. At least in modern times, there are some records going back a little bit further that may not have been exceeded. Um, this is all 1994 stuff. This is Allison. This is tax day, so back-to-back -back record flooding in a year on Cypress and in the reservoir areas. This is Claudette, 79 down here. But notice the large amount of this county that did not have record flooding. Because I've heard so many times since Harvey, I didn't flood and I'm never going to flood. This map tells you the water has been higher in these areas before. Most of the record on White Oak Bayou is still tropics from Allison. The record on Spring Creek is October 1994. Harvey did not exceed that in these areas. So even if you didn't flood on Harvey, that doesn't mean you can't flood. Go through some images here. This is Cypress. Uh, here's Tax Day, so seven feet higher than Tax Day. I'm not sure how good that 49 mark is. Could be pretty good. Um, we see mass amounts of flooding on Cypress. We had one serious situation. This is the Inverness Forest levee. See, we came very close to overtopping this levee. There's two levees in Harris County. One is this one, Inverness Forest. The second one is Northgate on Spring Creek. Um, this is the Hardy Toll Road here. This is a subdivision built in the early 2000s, built to policies and all that. Nobody did anything wrong here. The storm simply exceeded the design and the homes flooded. Point your attention to that. The water level on the creek was so high, uh, the water came back through the pump station of the levee and cascaded down into the base of the levee and eroded below the pump station. Uh, this was on Monday morning and we were very concerned that we were going to lose this levee in Harris County. This was one of the more stressful situations we had to deal with in the emergency operations center. Uh, evacuating the subdivision uh, in case of the catastrophic failure of that levee. The west fork of the San Jacinto River, I never thought we'd exceed October 1994, and Harvey exceeded it by three feet. This is US 59 coming up out of Bumble, those squiggly lines of the concrete barriers that used to be in the freeway in the middle, the water just pushed them across the freeway. Uh, tremendous flooding on the west fork of the San Jacinto River. Not only tremendous flooding, but tremendous amounts of siltation along that channel of the river. Clear Creek at 45, this is where we had the 47.4. This is the creek, the creek expanded to about two miles wide, and 10 to 15,000 homes flooded along Clear Creek in Harris, Galveston, Missouri County. Uh, some of the areas here, rooftop level flooding, portions of Friendswood. We also saw rooftop level flooding along portions of the San Jacinto, Greens Bayou, Hunting Bayou, Buffalo Bayou. And that's really the first time in Harris County minus Allison and a few isolated areas that we had life-threatening flooding in homes where people could actually drown in their homes. 
Harvey was that storm. Uh, this is Buffalo. Uh, two floods, kind of, if you will, on Buffalo. But one thing I'd like to point out is look at the exceedance of the previous record on this channel. Uh, October, or, uh, April of 09, about six feet higher than the previous record. And any of you that have dealt with hydrology before, when we talk about hydro records, we usually talk about a couple tenths of a foot. Six feet above the previous record on Buffalo Bay. Um, just tremendous damage on the channel. This is a natural sandy channel. So when you put that much water in there, there's going to be a lot of issues, especially with the vegetation, with the collapsing of the channel banks, and then of course the releases that occur, traumatics and barker, that maintain those water levels for an extended period of time. Uh, this is one of the more interesting statistics uh, for the ship channel at Manchester. This is the tide gauge, the NOAA tide gauge. that shows Hurricane Ike's seawater storm surge as salt water coming up the ship channel during Ike, 12.34 feet, and Harvey's fresh water runoff almost equaled Hurricane Ike's seawater storm surge. It's the highest freshwater runoff we've ever put down the ship channel, at least in modern time. Uh, this is Attics, so this is that northern reservoir. Uh, government owned land of the reservoir pool is about the 100 year event. And that's about 102.7 feet or so. And we got there about tax day. So on tax day, we had a little bit of water in some of the subdivision streets in Bear Creek Village. And who would have known uh, less than a year later, a little bit more than a year later, we go six and a half feet higher than that. This time, water came off the government owned land into the flood pool where we have thousands of residential structures built, and a lot of those were flooded. Some of them very deep. This was a little bit longer term inundation, you're talking a couple weeks to maybe three weeks in some areas. Uh, also, added for the first time the engagement of this North End spillway. And simply what the spillway is, this is what it looks like. It ties back into our natural flat ground here. And so when the water in the pool gets high enough, it will simply just spill out around the end of this building. And that's what it did. It's very complicated. You can see there's a lot going on. Somebody talked about, the previous speaker talked about the complexities we face. Well, here's a great example. You've got neighborhoods, you've got commercial development, you have a tension basin, you have roadside and underground drainage uh, ditches, you have lateral channels, and you have a reservoir pool, and it's all interacting right here. And honestly, we had no idea what was going to happen as that water started to spill out. We were doing a lot of 2D modeling to try to figure out how it was going to flow over the land. So this is the West Belt. This is the face of Attic Dam. This is the water coming out. And this is what would have happened if the pool would have reached 112 feet, which is what the forecast was. Luckily, we only reached 109. And most of the water that came out was able to be absorbed into the underground drainage system within about a half a mile of the point where it's coming out of the reservoir. Had it reached 112 feet, that would not have been the case. You can see all this water would have poured down above the ground, overwhelming the drainage systems to Buffalo, and even still, it would have had to use the Bell 8 underpasses to cut through to Spring Branch. So tens of thousands of more structures would have flooded if that reservoir would have hit 112. This is Barker. Uh, this is the release from Barker. This is Highway 6, Buffalo Bay. This is the full notice. There's not a lot of difference between the downstream release and the upstream pool elevation. So there was some question when the floodgates were opened, um, how much water is exactly getting out of these floodgates because of the lack of difference. These, these dams are meant to be operated when Buffalo Bayou is at a much lower condition. And that just was not the case for Harvey. You had significant flooding taking place downstream of these dams uh, when the water was released. Uh, a lot of the flooding in Barker was in the Fort Bend County section of Canyon Gate and Cinco Ranch. About 3,000 homes flooded in that area. Notice also six and a half feet above the previous record in Barker, six and a half feet in Attics, and that's because the rainfall, the rainfall across both of these reservoirs was fairly uniform. About 28 to 32 inches of rain across both reservoirs. The damage, uh, Harvey will come in number two to Katrina. Katrina still remains the costliest natural disaster in American history at $160 billion. 60,000 persons were rescued by government resources, and at least 30 to 40,000 were likely rescued by civilian resources. It's the first time ever 
that we had no government resources to deploy on that Sunday morning, and Judge Emmett went out and asked for civilian help to go out and, and rescue people. Um, the numbers, and these are final, effective Monday, 154,170 homes flooded in Harris County. Uh, that's about 11% of the total structure footprint in this county, based on the HCAD data. 105,000 of these homes, or 68%, were outside the mapped 1% floodplain. They were not required to have flood insurance. Of the 154, 170, 36% had flood insurance. The average payout for a flood insurance claim for Harvey, a, a resident who had flood insurance, was $120,000. The average payout for an individual who did not have flood insurance but got FEMA individual assistance aid was between four and $7,000. I don't know any stronger statistic right there than that to encourage people to get flood insurance. A couple things this map shows. You can see the very deep concentrations here of the flooding. Clearly, this is from Channel. This is Meyerland, Bel Air, Buffalo, Cypress, uh, the West Fork, uh, Greens and Halls here, uh, all kinds of bad stuff going on down here. But notice the areas where you have this speckled look away from the channel, away from the big bayous. This is all areas that were experiencing structure flooding from overwhelmed internal drainage systems. They're not mapped floodplains. They're not required to have flood insurance. Um, it's a big problem we face here because of, like you saw earlier, our geography, our topography, and our rainfall rates. Uh, we can flood. And in this case, inches can make the difference. Uh, a lot of times, this is short-term, shallow flooding, six inches or less. But it's damaging nonetheless. Uh, you can see with this, we practically doubled Allison's damage. And if you look at tax day here of 10,000, there's just no comparison to some of our previous events. Harvey's just so far off the charts, it's, it's really hard to wrap your head around. And on top of this, uh, five to 15,000 multifamily units and thousands of commercial buildings. We do have time, we have time for questions? Anybody has any questions? I do. Yes. You said, uh, I'm not sure if we don't have some issues here. Um, you said the bayous are really effective at moving water away. Why is that? So the, our, our bayous in the center of, of the city are what, we, what I'll call our urban bayous, uh, Braze Bayou, White Oak Bayou. Uh, they've been channelized. Um, they convey water very fast and very quickly. Um, they were able to carry the water very quickly away. Now, what happens with those channels is they can become overwhelmed by the intense rainfall rate. So if you get eight, 10, 12 inches of rain in a couple hours, those watersheds are gonna rise up very quickly, come out, and then as soon as the rain stops, they're gonna go back down and return fall below back their bank. And that's because they're very urban. So the water pretty much gets to them instantaneously. On the outer part of the county, where it's more rural, the water takes time to drain to the actual creek or the bayou. So it may take eight or 10 hours for water to fall in a field to then eventually get to that creek or bayou. And if you keep dumping water, you just keep repeating that process and the water ends up getting really, really high. Um, but there was, really if you look at Harvey, there was, we had two floods. We had a urban flash flood on Saturday night and Sunday, which resulted in flooding, for example, on Braze Bayou and portions of Buffalo and White Oak Bayou. And then those watersheds started to go down. And it wasn't until Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday where we saw the highest water levels, for example, on Cypress Creek, uh, the San Jacinto River Basin, Cedar Bayou, Clear Creek, because it takes time for that water to get to those channels. Yeah, back in the back. Yeah, Jeff, thank you for a great presentation. If there had been heavy dredging of Lake Houston, Attics, and Marker, before the flood, what impact would that have had, do you think, in reducing the, the footprint? Um, I, I don't, on 
on the west fork of the San Jacinto River, uh, there was quite a bit of sedimentation that came down in, in the Memorial Day weekend storm of, of uh, 2016. So this is different than Memorial Day 15. Um, there might have been some help for that, but honestly, the volumes of water we're talking about with Harvey, uh, it probably wouldn't have made that big of a difference. So for US 59 on the west fork, we had about 250,000 cubic feet of water per second coming through the West Fork. Compare that with Bray's Bay that had about 41,000 at the medical center. So we're talking massive amounts of water. Um, as far as the reservoirs go, uh, one thing to keep in mind about the reservoirs is a lot of the sedimentation that comes in from the, feed, the creeks that feed the reservoirs actually falls out very quickly where the creek meets the reservoir pool because the water slows down and that sediment drops out. And so the flood control district with the Army Corps have been working to do selective sedimentation clearing, especially where those creeks terminate in to the reservoir. So that would be our right of way uh, that we can keep that area cleaned. And we had actually just finished removing a lot of sedimentation for tax day when Harvey happened. And it pretty much, you know, filled back up again. So we're working again right now to remove the sedimentation, at least on the feeder creeks. Uh, I'm not going to comment on what the Corps is doing with the reservoirs, but I, I don't know. One more? One more. One more. Right here. When you look at the number of structures involved with the flash floods versus the later flooding, which, which produced more damage? Uh, I probably have to say, and I don't know the exact numbers, um, because we, we have to go ask every person who flooded when did they flood to know if it was which one. But given that corridor through the, the urban heart of Harris County, which is more susceptible to those intense rainfalls and more the flash flooding, I would think a lot of the structure flooding came from that flash flooding on Saturday night and Sunday morning. Um, probably, I would say if I had to guess, maybe a 60-40 type split, where 60% was on Saturday and Sunday, but 40% was still going to flood on those creeks and bayous a little bit later.